Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for episode seven. I'm starting to feel like a Star Wars reference here. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for joining us for episode seven of Ham Talk. It is sponsored by the Hamsters Week Signal Group. And we'll do some quick introductions, though. I'm guessing by the time you get to episode seven, you probably know who we are by now. <laughs> My name is Sam. I'm K-E-0-L-M-Y. This is Mel Miss Melissa. Hi, Melissa. K-I-5-I-C-Q. Mr. Greg. And I'm Greg, in 5 xo now, unfortunately, Andrea is not with us this month. We've had some scheduling issues and well, you guys know how it is. And if you don't know how it is, I have a crazy schedule. Greg has a crazy schedule. Melissa's hanging on for dear life. And we don't even know what Andrea is doing at the moment. So <laughs> we're going to make stuff up. <laughs> She's someplace between here and New Jersey. There you go. <clears throat> hey, y'all wave. If you see her go by, by now, you know what her car looks like with all the antennas on it. So just wave. Kind of hard to miss. <laughs> <laughs> so the interesting thing that we started talking about before we started filming is the fact that Greg has decided he's on a beach this month. <laughs> Melissa's <laughs> able to put the beach on, but I think she gets a little laggy when she does. She I can't seasick. get the beach at all. <laughs> I am in the office where I work. I'm not allowed to have a beach. <laughs> so Greg, my friend, I'm afraid that we also brought dinosaurs into it. Trust me, we'll do some outtakes or something where we'll tell you the story about the dinosaurs and Greg. <laughs> but in the meantime, watch for a meteorite hitting right across his sky right there. And if you see it, just trust me. It's for the dinosaurs. I think there's ageism going on here. <laughs> <clears throat> well, anyway, so we do have an awesome show planned for you. And you, as usual, are an awesome audience for hanging in here with us we're going to have a good time because it gets stale after a while if we just talk about the same things and if we just plan how everything's going to go. So we'd love to just jump in here and start talking together. And now Melissa has got a question for us this month, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But really quick, since I don't have a segment, I'd like to say a few things. And I think there's some of you out there who are going to empathize a little bit with not only myself, I'm considered a newer ham because I've only had my licenses for four years now, going up on four years. Um, and Miss Melissa is very new. So <laughs> I want to talk for a second about the frustrations of this hobby, because trust me, not a lot of people want to talk about it in just an everyday kind of manner. They want to get into the technical stuff. Yes, first of all, the technical stuff is frustrating. It really is. Every bit of it. When you're trying to get equipment to work and it malfunctions. When you have tried everything before you're getting ready to run an exercise and it runs perfectly. You get in the exercise, it malfunctions. <laughs> it happens every time. So let me say a little bit about some of the other frustrations that I've run across. And Melissa, if you have any that you yourself have run across, pipe up, because this is going to be our moment right here. So one of the hardest things that I encountered as a brand new ham coming into this four years ago was the frustration when I asked a ham radio operator, what radio should I get? Let me tell you all. <laughs> never ask that question <laughs> you will literally get 500 different answers from 500 different hams there is this huge war between Kenwood, uh, Kenwood and ICOM and Yezu and Baofeng and 14 other things I'm sure Greg right now is going oh god she just said Baofeng <laughs> <laughs> but it, it genuinely is the first thing you want to know, because if you're learning something, you want to put your hands on it. You want to get in there and get it and touch it and, and understand how it works. But you ask somebody what's the best radio to get, and you're going to get a different answer from every person. Let me tell you something. I'm still carrying the exact same bow thing. I, I don't even have it with me today, but I'm still carrying the same one that I bought four years ago. It's been run over by cars. It has been dropped. It has been kicked across the floor. And the stupid thing is still working. And it cost me 35 bucks. <laughs> okay. I still have it. I also have a Yezu 991A that I got from my lovely husband when he 
wanted to congratulate me for making general. And I love it. I love my little shack in a box, but I go back time and again to that tiny little bofang because it is going to last me. And it's proven it. Melissa, you are a little frustrated right now. Tell them a little bit about the frustration you're facing. Well, um, I just started listening. I just subscribed and I started listening to three or four different ham podcasts, just audio, audio shows. And uh, I listened to them long enough to where um, um, I wanted to get a, a, a starter uh, handheld. And uh, when I started hearing one come up often, I was like, okay, that's the one I'm going to get. So that was a place to start. <laughs> but then you got a nice new radio that you just got, but what happened? <laughs> I haven't opened the book on it yet. <laughs> so exactly. I think Greg probably knows a lot more about it than I do. And that's a point that you run across when you're a brand new ham is it's not easy to learn this stuff. It's not easy to, to just jump in there. Oh, I've got a brand new radio. Somebody just like us, we were given brand new, uh, you know, my daughter and I, we were given a brand new radio and we were like, what are we supposed to do with this? Okay, there's a lot of technical babble in passing the test and, and understanding, but then it's a whole new world when you go from looking at these diagrams to actually putting your hands on the equipment. And it is frustrating. I mean, I, I know you guys could feel it out there. Believe me, I finally, after two and a half years, got to a point where I could muddle my way through hooking up my own radios and putting up my own antennas and doing all the things I needed to do. But I still have times when it just, I just want to, oh, the whole thing, right? You well, feel my, it, don't you, Melissa? One of my frustrations uh, has been this COVID stuff with the, you know, the alienation and people staying in their homes, not being able to visit, not being able to get out. And um, it really put me behind on, um, um, I've actually been hoping that Greg would, he's supposed to be coming out to help me find placement for my antenna. And, and that, that, that had been delayed for many, many months. So um I just kind of feel like the, the gates have just recently opened going, Hey, you know, we're, we're open full time. And, um, Greg had his antenna, uh, party at his house. So we had, we had a lot of fun that day and, uh, it just, he, he's so busy. I've been busy doing other things. My husband just put, uh, two bathroom renovations on my plate. So now I have that. So I'm actually in the process of still trying to coordinate with Greg to come out and so we can get that antenna. My, I was able to get a 35 foot antenna uh, or a tower rather. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to, I want to put it in the most ideal place. So I, I don't want to guess. I don't want to, you know, try and do this on my own. He's the professional. <laughs> so <laughs> Professional amateur. That's right. But you bring up a good point and something that people have taken two different stances on how the pandemic has affected amateur radio. We are seeing the numbers go up on the number of hams that are getting licensed. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot more people are speaking on the radio because they had to have that social distancing during the pandemic. But then you get the people that are like, this just literally put a stop for an entire year to me trying to learn. You are that person. You are that key person that just got slammed to a stop. Well, well, with, with, yeah, with Greg so close and his studio and his, his ham shack and everything. And we had had plans for me to come down and hang out and, you know, do some of the shows from there and everything. And it's like, okay, everybody go home and lock down. <laughs> so, so see, these frustrations don't just come from not knowing what, wire to plug into what it, it comes from a, a plethora of different places and Greg has been kind enough through this entire thing even through this whole web show that we're doing he has put up with so much crap with our schedule and and not knowing how to do things and him even having to look right Greg you've had to learn new things with the computers and and everything 
Yeah, I'm learning a whole bunch of new uh, software and and everything. So it uh, it is uh, it's it's been interesting this whole year. And I know Melissa has been very frustrated because she's been wanting to come and operate out of the shack. And because of COVID, we of course didn't have anybody over at the house. And uh, then because of COVID, I'm a year and a half behind on my shack remodel. So then I just finish it and now I'm moving it. <laughs> so, you know, Imagine that. work's never done on a shack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the, the kind of the running joke around here is uh, I, I spend more time oper or building my ham shacks than I do uh, operating anymore. <laughs> and uh, spend more I time moving radios too. <laughs> yeah, I can't really find much of an argument to uh, deny that. But oh, uh, we're wow. getting there. And it's going to be nice because uh, we're all going to Huntsville. Melissa is going to uh, join Ruth and me on the trip there. So uh, we're driving, so we'll have a day and a half of drive time to uh, let her pick our brains and also do some operating on the radio while we're driving. So uh, we've got HF and uh, six meters, two meters and everything in there. So she'll be able to Don't do Don't let him talk about radios that whole time. You make sure you slip in information about dinosaurs and meteor spikes <laughs> and and a buzzer, because I heard that there was some people that liked buzzer's appearance in one of the things we did. So anyway. Well, what, what's funny about the Huntsville trip is that I thought we were going to Huntsville, Texas. And I was like, yeah, I'll go. That's no big deal. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, then, I got the, then I got the hotel reservation, you know, the confirmation. I'm like, <gasps> Okay, <laughs> that's where we're going. A little bit of difference. You know, a big clue should have been, I asked how far Huntsville was from you in this conversation uh, <laughs> on here on one of the episodes. And yeah. you would have thought Melissa might have paid attention. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, I'll tell you, if the next trip is into Missouri to come see me, because all of you live together, so y'all need to road trip up to see me here at the beautiful lake of the ozarks i'm telling you guys i just learned that camden county was called the, the water dragon county because of the shape of the lake looks like a chinese dragon oh that's the neat. That they wind. yeah so that's really neat as a matter of fact i might um have greg drop in a here you go greg put in editing put it like right here <laughs> okay in between the fingers yeah, between the fingers, you, you, yeah. can, you can nail that, right? <laughs> You're getting better at this editing thing, right? <laughs> Actually, the new software is kind of cool because uh, there is a segment where, and I, I have you plans for you. You just go, and here's Melissa, and her head's going to pop right in your hand right there. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'd love that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm trying to figure out to get the exact placement, but the new editing software is, is incredible. It's the same oh, software. Happy, they, have them stand in my hand like I can go, and here's Greg. <laughs> <laughs> that there would be is. cool. I would love that. <laughs> well, we can do that. Uh, <laughs> this software is the same stuff they used to edit Jurassic Park, so it's supposed oh, to... Wow. That's funny. That, that's funny. My husband's watching that movie right now. <laughs> and we literally just started talking about dinosaurs. Tell me this wasn't meant to be. Weird. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> On that. You All know, right. One, so, what, what, One of the things I'm going to just throw in there, because um, it was kind of funny, the conversation that you and Melissa were having and stuff. So it's a great segue into a segment from Raisa. Uh, oh, out great. of St. Petersburg. She, uh, she sent us a video for this month uh, on uh, a YL setting up a portable station in the park by herself cool. and stuff. So oh, why yeah. don't we watch she, that real quick? Problems. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and watch that one real quick. Okay. Hello, my friends. This is Raisa R1BIG. And I have a question. Can a young lady install uh, portable ham radio position alone and I am in this wonderful place 
what I need for my uh, portable blocking. Big shot, because I have no here masts and uh, I will choose one tree uh, and use it like a mast. Of course, I need a battery and I have uh, my transceiver, my portable transceiver and the uh, device for checking uh, SWR. It is very important, but I need it later. Of course, the antenna. I will use uh, Monobon uh, uh, dipole antenna. Uh, it is 20 meters band antenna. Uh, cable. And, of course, it is very necessary to be safety. Let's start. I will use two cameras. Uh, because I have not um, GoPro camera. It will be so. Now I will try to get it up on the tree. I need this one. What I have now it's good. My dipole is not high. I don't know how high is it, but I will try. I have to tune. Very good. SWR only one. I'm very happy! Now the antenna is ready and uh, SWR is uh, 1.0 I'm very happy and now I will install my table and uh, all other equipment
Radio One, Bravo, India Golf, Stroke Portable. Romeo One, uh, Bravo, India Golf, Slash Portable. Good afternoon, your five seven. My name is Tudor, Tango Uniform Delta Oscar Romeo, and I'm 13 years old. Uh, Todor, welcome to our wonderful ham radio world and I'm really very happy that you are a young person and you are in our hobby. My dipole worked very well and the answer on the question in the beginning of my video is yes, <sighs> young lady can organize her portable walking on the air very well. You will see it on the qrset.com uh, where I'm living. So and, uh, beautiful and so nice evening. And I'm so summer. happy around, uh, that I did it. My cottage is wonderful forest uh, near the beautiful lake. Okay, uh, it is a great pleasure to me uh, that you uh, watched my videos from the center of St. Petersburg uh, and uh, on my channel there are many different videos uh, from different places uh, because uh, I can running only portable uh, and uh, today uh, I'm also I'm making making video right now and uh, our QSO will be in uh, my YouTube channel too. This is Radio 1 Bravo India Golf for Delta Foxtrot 5 Kilo uh, Victor. Raisa, so many thanks. Uh, many sessions calling you, I think. Uh... Raisa, yes. Uh, nice to meet you on the frequency. Glad to have you on the log. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Please give me your likes. Don't hesitate about the comments below. Uh, I wish you all the best 73 and 88. See you next time. A blonde YL can do anything she sets her mind to. I'm not speaking personally or anything, but you know, yes, we can. And number two, I want one of those slingshots because I've never done that and it looks so cool. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's that's really cool. So then I believe Miss Melissa has got a question for us for this yes, month. Yes, yes, I have. It's a fairly long comment with a question at the end, and it comes from Roger. He says, in our area, there's a lot of activity on 146.52 Simplex, not as much as a few years ago, but still a higher level than most repeaters. We have a guy in the area who's very active and has a strong, loud signal, but he is deaf, question mark. He brags about his big amp and his preamp he has on the amp. He puts out his call sign numerous times throughout the day. And because his signal is so strong, people all over come back to him, but he cannot hear about 80% of those people. Why can he not hear the station? His standard response to others on the air is everyone else has a crap station. I doubt everyone, but this individual has a crap station. The big problem is many people are frustrated. He's calling and calling and cannot hear them. He can't hear most of the stations, but is so strong and loud that he walks all over the conversations. Suggestions on how to handle this. Wow. Well, first of all, that's called an alligator. And uh, that, that offers up a whole lot of uh, things. So let's go ahead and bring that up as a topic of discussion here, and we'll discuss exactly what, when, how, 
and why uh, that uh, you have that. So let's go ahead and a uh, uh, couple of the things that we can roll into on that. So good, good question, Roger. Okay, uh, first thing I wanna do is I wanna clarify something. I didn't mean to come off as rude or condescending in my initial comment. Uh, let me kind of explain. In amateur radio circles, an alligator is referred to as someone that's all mouth with no ears. Uh, and this happens in a lot of different ways. Uh, not all of them with malice, okay? Uh, sometimes they're done out of ignorance. Sometimes they're done because the person has the wrong idea of what makes a high quality station. And then other times it's done simply by accident because the other station doesn't realize that their radio's deaf, okay? So let's, let's look at a couple of things that can turn you into an alligator such as you describe and the, the drawbacks to it. Uh, the first and foremost is the uh, ham who thinks that the best station out there is the one that's got the biggest, baddest, booming signal out there. So they tend to uh, take a radio, and we'll just say in your example, get on 146.52, and uh, they're now transmitting uh, three, 400 watts of power, and they're out talking their station's ability to receive probably two to one, if not more uh on that so what happens is they irritate more people than they impress because yeah they got that big booming signal going out but they can't hear all the stations coming back to them so they frustrate the heck out of a lot of people that are coming back to them the other drawback to that setup is that uh when they're out talking their ability to hear they're walking on people and uh, we have a situation with that here local on 146.52, where we've got a station that uh, on a regular basis starts having a conversation right over other conversations because he can't hear them. But uh, in his case, he's running a lot of power. So he's walking on top of the other conversations that he can't hear or causing a lot of interference, which then gets him classified as a lid and uh, creates a whole bunch of other problems on that. So in that particular case, it, it's done out of ignorance, okay? But let's look at the situation where a guy might be running 100, 150 watts. Well, let's just say 100 watts. Uh, and this is also a situation that happened in this uh, region a while back. Uh, guy had a Kenwood TS-2000 and the receiver actually went bad. I mean, even with the preamp on, it was deaf and he had no no knowledge that he couldn't hear um the stations uh, if you can't hear them you don't know they're there right so what he was doing is he was sitting here and he was calling out and stations were coming back to him but basically uh just as a rough example he wasn't hearing them unless they were like an s5 or greater okay they just wouldn't even break his squelch uh it turned out his radio receiver uh had damage to the front end and uh, it was deaf. So he was doing it out of ignorance of a problem that he had. Uh, in the case of the other operator, he was doing it out of ignorance of amateur radio and how it communicates. And that's where it's important that uh, you educate yourself as you uh, build a station. Uh, where I see this kind of problem the most is on people, they'll have like a, uh, say 150 feet of RG213 going up to their two meter uh, antenna. And they're having trouble getting into a repeater or people are saying, hey, we can't hear you uh, and work you on uh, simplex, et cetera. So their solution to it is to go get more power. All right, well, now they've overcome the loss in that RG213, but the receive side is coming back down and they're not able to hear the station still. So they inadvertently further compound the problem rather than creating a solution to it. Um, my uh, recommendation for how to handle it is I would either first reach out in a non-threatening, non-intimidating manner, uh, email, a phone call or something. I wouldn't confront somebody on the air like that because you're going to embarrass them and their first response is to 
react. Okay, so reach out to them via email or a phone call and say, hey, you know, I just wanted to point out that when you're, you're calling CQ, you've got a credible signal, congratulations, but you're not hearing all the stations coming back to you and you are uh, having issues with the, uh, the reception. So you're not hearing these people, plus you're walking on other people because you're not hearing the conversations going on, but your signal's so strong, you're actually dominating and, and conquering uh, other conversations going on. And then depending on how he reacts, you've got a couple of options. You guys can work together, uh, come together as the ham community, mentor each other, and help, uh, help fix the issues that are out there. Uh, and that's the way we should do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've done this with a lot of people over the years, uh, helped improve each other's stations. Uh, at one time, I was learning how to improve mine uh on two meters uh i thought i had a great station boy i found out the the hard way that uh, <laughs> you know what i didn't have as great of a station as i thought i did when i started comparing what i could do to other people's stations so i i went out and started learning and uh everything and that's when i found out how important feed line loss is uh then if if you're rebuffed uh, or uh, you are uh, uh, treated rudely back and it's apparent that the guy really doesn't care what anybody else's opinion of his station is or his operating habits. If he's causing malicious jamming and interference, then it's time to get the FCC involved and uh, you can go online and file a complaint and stuff. But that ought to be the last result because number one, we don't want to create conflict where we don't need it. Uh, so my first suggestion is to reach out to the guy and uh, see, it's very possible he doesn't know he's not being heard. You know, um, ignorance is bliss, <laughs> you know? So it, it's very possible that, that he thinks he's got a booming station, a great, great radio station, and he's doing well, and he just pure and simple can't hear, okay? So don't assume malice. Uh, try to work with him first, and then escalate the issue if it, if it needs to be. All right. Anyway, that, that's just my thought on the subject. Okay, and we're hoping that that helped Rob, Roger out and uh, answered that question for him. Um, I do have, we do have three other comments. One is from Joe. Joe says, great episodes as always. Really enjoyed Andrea's talk with Ann, especially Ann learning and enjoying CW. And Mike says, amazing the amount of loss there is in these cables. Wow. It's a wonder anyone can talk to anyone else with all the loss there is. Those poor 100 watts don't have a chance. And he laughed. And Corey says, great show. Don't forget 60 meters for regional type communications that are independent from contesting issues. That's a good band to have a discussion on. 60 meters, the channelized band. Look, I feel for all my people that are like me, stuck on 100 watts and a wire type of thing. That's that's where I'm at. <laughs> so I'm with you. <laughs> You're my people. <laughs> well, I am certainly missing Andrea. She always brings something else to this. I think the four of us together make a really strong group for this uh, ham talk. So why don't we go on over to Andrea and she's going to tell us a little bit about the June UHF VHF contest. All right, there we go. VHF roving has all the excitement and all the chaos one might expect if you were to combine ham radio with a scavenger hunt and a college road rally. For those new to the show, this is Rover, my contest station on wheels. Rover has been built to be fully operational, either parked or in motion. I use a roll-on, roll-off strategy for fixed locations where no equipment nor antennas need to be deployed. Rover is capable of operating on all amateur bands from 80 meters through 9 centimeters. 
For purposes of the contest, however, there are only eight bands that I will be using. These are six meters, two meters, one and a quarter meters, and 70 centimeters, plus the microwave bands of 33 centimeters, which is 902 megahertz, 23 centimeters, which is 1.2 gigahertz, 13 centimeters, which is 2.3 gigahertz, and 9 centimeters, which is 3.4 gigahertz. During contests, I operate as a rover, which means I move from grid square to grid square. Every time I change a grid, I am eligible to be worked again. For the start of the contest, I joined up with some of the Texas rovers at the grid corner southeast of San Antonio. The corner itself is in the oil fields just outside the small town of Falls City. Grid corners are good locations for rovers as the rover can operate from four different grids while spending little time moving between grids. This grid corner is particularly nice as one can go through all four grids by driving less than one mile. The rovers I met up with were KD-5 IKG, KA-5D, and W-5TN. At the start of the contest, we each moved into a separate grid. This way, fixed stations working us would be able to pick up all the multipliers of all four grids early in the contest, even if they didn't work us after we rotated grids. My first contact in the contest was with Kilo Mike 5 Romeo Golf. Kilo Mike 5 Romeo Golf, Kilo 2 Echo Zulu Rover. Uh, Kilo 2 Red Rover, uh, Kilo Mike 5 Romeo Golf, Echo Lima 09. QSL, also, also Echo Lima 09er. Okay, copy, Alpha Echo Lima 09, thanks. Thank you. And thus started several hours of operating at the grid corner. With four microphones, four sets of radio controls, a rotator controller to my right, transverter selector switch in the back seat, and antenna selector switches mounted at the roof console, I am in regular motion making all the adjustments needed to work stations and QSY them through the bands. Periodically we would change grids so us rovers could work other stations again as well as each other. While Dave, W5TN, is an experienced rover, his driver this contest is new and forgot just how much those antennas stick beyond the back of the vehicle. Fortunately, it wasn't difficult to untangle the antenna from the fence and after pulling forward, most of the bend came out. Apparently, we don't have sufficient radio equipment as sometimes we find ourselves resorting to more primitive means of okay. communication. <laughs> you, was I strong to you on that one? After nearly five hours, it was time for me to move off the grid corner and start heading towards our dinner spot, the Devil's Backbone Overlook. As usual, I was the last one to leave the grid corner, with the other rovers having left almost 30 minutes earlier. My first priority after leaving the grid corner was finding a restroom. It also wouldn't hurt to top off rover's tank. After I was done pumping gas, I noticed coolant leaking from rover. I run rover's coolant system unpressurized during roves just in case of a problem. This way it will just leak at a rate that is hopefully manageable. I had a question answer. Could I manage this or would I have to abort my rove? This did not look promising. I decided to do what I do best and procrastinate. After adding half a gallon of coolant, I proceeded to head to the overlook. This wouldn't bring me closer to home, but it would bring me closer to help. Although I was a bit preoccupied by the leak, I did work some stations while on my way to the lookout. 
Here are a couple examples. Contest, CQ Contest, Kilo 2, Echo Zulu Rover Contest. Uh, what grade are you in? Uh, Echo Lima 0 Niner. Alpha Bravo 5, Echo Bravo, Echo Lima 0 Niner. Alpha Bravo 5, Echo Bravo. Kilo 2, Echo Zulu Rover. Also, Echo Lima 0 Niner. Okay, 70%. Okay, did you want to try um, the 432 or 6 meters? Yeah, we can try both. I'll go to uh, 432 right now. Okay, see you there, 432. After turning up the volume on the 6 meter rig, I hear someone calling on 432. Is somebody calling me here? I arrive at the Devil's Backbone Lookout without issue. This is a good location but very public, so there are often interruptions by the curious. I work a few stations, including K5TRA, who had been looking for me, then take a break to assess the coolant issue. It does not look encouraging. Rover has lost all the coolant I added in the one hour of driving. Searching for the source of the leak, I find a compound crack in the plastic at the top of the radiator. The leak was somewhat manageable. Being at the top, the amount of coolant that could be lost was limited. On the other hand, my plans were to go through Dallas, Little Rock, and finally to Tulsa. That was a long way to go, having to top off the coolant hourly, and that is assuming the leak did not get any worse. I ultimately decided it is too risky to continue my rove. With plenty of spare coolant, I eventually start my two and a half hour drive back to Brenham. Feeling somewhat dejected, I've turned off the radios and have given up on operating. During my drive, I end up behind this erratic driver. Fortunately, they get off the road before anyone gets hurt. As the drive continues, I start to think about an earlier suggestion to use JB Weld to patch the radiator. At the time, the suggestion seemed impractical, but maybe part of the rove could be salvaged. I could clean the area before I went to bed, and it would have overnight to dry and cool down. Then, if I get up early and be at the auto parts store when they open, I could get what I need, patch the radiator, and still have enough time to catch up with the Oklahoma Rovers near Tulsa before the end of the contest. I arrive home in Brenham without incident. In the morning, I find this at the auto parts store, which seems to be just what I needed. It is resistant to coolant, comes with fiberglass sheeting for reinforcement, and promises a 20-minute cure time. I complete the repair by 9 a.m. with only minor headaches. The instructions claim I can add coolant as soon as the epoxy is no longer tacky. While the patch cures, I clean up, take a shower, and load up Rover. Close to an hour later, I check the repair. It is still tacky on the surface. Since it otherwise feels solid, I add coolant anyway. By 10 a.m., I am back on the road and back in the contest. In order to make Tulsa, 
I will have to keep stops to the minimum and work most stations on the move. This is a style Rover is well adapted for. K5LLL, K5TR, K5QE, and K5IM become regular QSO targets. I work them multiple times as I pass through several grids on my way towards Dallas. As I approach Dallas, I start losing some of them, but pick up other stations such as WB5ZDP, WA5LFD, and N5ENU. These stations keep me company in the grids through Dallas and into Oklahoma. And again. November 5, Echo November Uniform, QSL Echo Mike 1 2, Echo Mike 24, Echo Mike 24, QSL. One of the most memorable stations worked during my run for Tulsa was WQ0P. I was still a good 40 minutes south of Tulsa and they were 240 miles away in Kansas. While not an exceptionally far distance, I did work them on six bands and it may have been my best DX on 902 and 1296 megahertz this contest. I catch up with the Oklahoma Rover teams of N0LD Rover and K5 SRT Rover along with Tommy WD5 AGO Rover at the grid corner outside Tulsa with just two hours left in the contest. These rovers were focusing on the microwave bands and this is my first opportunity to use my 2.3 gigahertz and my 3.4 gigahertz since I got out of range of KD5 IKG rover, K5 TR, and K5 LLL. About 45 minutes before the end of the contest, we are positioned on the EM15 EM25 grid line when a local approaches me asking questions. Hello. Amateur, amateur radio. Curious locals have been common in this area and for the most part find it interesting and offer no complaints. This person, however, quickly went from curious to suspicious. Suspicious of what? I don't know, but I've seen it before. I maintained my friendly manner, but saw where this was going and offered to leave. He expressed his answer quite crudely, so I started my move off this location for another spot. Well, if you'd like this to go, we can. These guys want us to go. K2EZ Rover, N0LD Rover, Echo Mike, 2 5. N0LD Rover, K2EZ Rover. Angry local headed your way, Echo Mike 15. After moving, the remainder of the contest was uneventful. My final contact was with N0 LD Rover. N0 LD Rover, K2 EZ Rover, Echo Mike 26. Copy the Echo Mike 26. And that concludes my June VHF contest effort. Before I close, a few loose edges to cover. My final score was 110,000 on 427 contacts. The final results will not be out for a few months, but we should get a preview when the raw scores appear a few weeks after the contest. The leak in my radiator held throughout the contest, although it remained tacky until Monday, so I'm glad I didn't wait on that. And I just want to thank all who contributed photos uh, to this uh, report. This is Kilo 2 Echo Zulu, roving reporter for Ham Talk. Okay, so you guys are going to be just as surprised as we are when we actually watch and see what Andrea did, because as of the filming of this part right here, 
we have no idea. So she's going to surprise all of us. So we hope that you enjoyed whatever Andrea gave you guys. <laughs> Leave it in the comments below, whether you like when it's a surprise to us or, you know, when we already know what we're going to be filming. And feel free to leave comments. Melissa likes to yes. read to us. Yes, I was just going to say, <laughs> I was just going to say, give us some comments, get, uh, you know, ask those questions. So what we're going to do a little bit now is different, I think, from what we've done on any of the past episodes. We're going to give a little foreshadowing to you guys on what's coming up on the next ham talk. So what's that, number eight? I'm not going to be on Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> We are not getting to episode nine, okay? <laughs> We're skipping it. <laughs> and that was the bikini and chains episode. <laughs> okay, so I am going to follow through on what I promised Melissa. Is I'm going to show her how I work with my Baofeng, Baofeng, however you want to say it. Um, because like I said, I've been using mine for four years. I love it. It's wonderful. So I'll do my whole segment will be on what I've done with it, how I've worked with it, how I've programmed it, or rather how my son has programmed it. <laughs> because if you're smart, you get people that are smarter than you to help you with this stuff. Mm -hmm. Greg. <laughs> wait, wait, wait until you have to start having people teach you how to program your VCR. Actually, I guess that's that's. I favorite. think I see the meteor in the distance, Greg. I see it. It's going to hit the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so, Greg, what do you got coming up next month? Uh, we're going to kind of follow up on the uh, last month's uh, show with uh, cable loss and everything. We're going to be working on antenna takeoff angles and uh, antenna temperatures and uh, SWRs and everything and how to maximize the gain from your antenna and how to make it work for your specific area. Not all antennas work everywhere. That is absolutely right. Cause out here in Missouri, we have rock everywhere and it interrupts everything. <laughs> and Miss Melissa is probably gonna have her questions and we want your comments. Guys, we gotta give Melissa something to do. You gotta put those comments right now. <laughs> And especially if we can get some more of the ham shacks, we, we need pictures. Yes, we want to see yes. more ham shacks. Yeah, yes. we've been lacking on uh, ham shack photos the last few months, haven't we? Um, and, you know, if there's any youth out there that are watching our show, Melissa, again, does a lot of the presentation for talking to the youth. And because you guys are all new, you know, it could be. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know an eight-year-old who just passed the extra and I'm going... <laughs> how is that even possible you are amazing any of you children out there that have gotten general class extra class you are amazing keep it up do something good with it yeah, it's a good hobby and it's a lot of fun i've been doing this since i was 10 and i'm gonna say the magic hasn't left the hobby for me yet and this is what my 53rd year See, that's well, awesome. I've been in the hobby a longer than either one of you guys been alive. Shh. I, I'm, the meteor's <laughs> getting closer. <laughs> it's already hit. <laughs> All right. Well, we want to thank you guys for joining us. We have so much fun filming this, whether Greg likes it or not. <laughs> and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day or relaxing in the evening after you've worked all day. We thank you for spending this time with us. So come back and see us next month. Greg will put out a lot of information and links down below to a lot of the things that we've been talking about. That way you know where to get the information from and when it's good information. Because there's sometimes out there, that might be another good segment for me to do when you're not getting good information. So once again, thank you for watching Ham Talk and it's sponsored by the wonderful Hamsters Week Signal Group. We appreciate them and everything they do to help people advance in the hobby. Join us next month. All right, y'all have a real good evening.